It might be the first thing you use in the morning and the last thing you use at night. Smartphones have become a big part of our daily lives. And yet there is much to be discussed to do with conflict minerals, child labor, and complex supply chains. But change could be in your hands. Here to speak about ethical and sustainable sourcing of conflict materials and production of smartphones is Eva Gauens, CEO of Fairphone, the Amsterdam-based phone manufacturer set to make a difference under the motto, change is in your hands. We are very excited to welcome her on our stage. Now let's have a warm round of applause for Eva. Oh, Welcome, Eva. Hello. Yeah, please take a, a seat. Yeah. So, welcome on our stage. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course. So, before we delve into Fairphone, we actually want to talk a little bit about what motivates you. So, previously you worked for Tony's Chocolonis as the first lady of chocolate. That was your official job title. And um, both are social enterprises. So what drives you to those kinds of companies? Yeah, well, to be fair, um, my choice for Tony Schuckel only was also a bit of a coincidence. <laughs> also? <laughs> um, so a friend of mine just bought the majority of the shares of, fair, of uh, Tony's and mm -hmm. asked me to join in. And that is what I did. But then the moment that you... Because my background was just uh, in normal companies, where mm -hmm. I now actually would like to not call them normal, but mm -hmm. um, the moment that you learn how it can be in a company that it really has an important mission, mm -hmm. and that the work that you're used to do in all those big corporates somehow become also, yeah, also becomes relevant for society, that gets under your skin. And the moment mm -hmm. that you've experienced that, I don't think, at least for me, it wasn't possible to, to go back to a normal company again. Mm. So the moment you experience that, it gets to you. <laughs> you also previously mentioned the term mission-driven company a lot. What does this term mean to you? Yeah, I think many companies now have a mission and a purpose, and then they, they start thinking a bit like, uh, okay, what kind of layer can we add or what kind of purpose can we come up with and the difference for both Fairphone and Tony's is that both companies really were founded out of a frustration um, and therefore the company is the means to an end mm -hmm. it's not the goal in itself mm, okay. for Tony's it was to eliminate slavery in the cocoa chain for Fairphone it is to show actually that phones can be more sustainable and fairer and then the moment that you, you have that frustration and you think, okay, but now I'm going to show it myself, mm -hmm. both initiatives weren't a company at start. Mm -hmm. At start, it was an awareness campaign or a TV program. And only after a few years of frustration, it was like, okay, we're going to show that actually things can be done differently. And that is why we become a company. Mm -hmm. And then you're, yeah, you already sense that your mission is really true. And it's something different when you have a company and after a while learn like mm, sustainability is becoming more and more relevant. Let's figure out if we can add this value to our company or this mission to our company. That's the big difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In a previous interview, you said chocolate consists of four ingredients, while smartphones consist of more than 400. How do you think your previous experience in the food industry translate to the smartphone industry? Yeah, actually four, uh, I need, <laughs> we had this, this number, it couldn't be more than seven. Uh, <laughs> but no, seven compared to 400. Um, yeah, to be fair, I was a bit naive when I started in the, in the smartphone business. I thought, nah, because of what I just told you, eh, both, similar companies with a, with a similar story, mission-driven, in a phase where it needed to, to rapidly scale. Now, I know how, how to manage a company, so I thought, okay, I can do this. I really underestimated how complex a smartphone and the technology in a smartphone is. Meanwhile, I know what it's like to work in a company that yeah, was founded as a TV campaign or an awareness uh, campaign, and then how to 
to make choices and to structure a bit what is the company about and to cherish the, the foundations. And meanwhile, um, yeah, how do I say that correctly? Scale that. So a bit the romance of the early days of a company where you hand carry an amount of fair trade gold to a factory that then actually can process it. That's not a scalable solution. And it was similar with, with Tony's. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a scalable solution yet. And that is something that I'm good at, to, to cherish and, and, and keep what originally was the idea it was founded upon, but then ensure and make a few choices, kill also quite a lot of darlings, and then, yeah, set up um, yeah, a company that can be scaled, and I know how to do that. Absolutely, that's great. Um, actually, it was this January, this very January, 10 years ago, that Fairphone was founded. Yeah. Could you tell us a bit more about the inception of the company? and uh, what makes Fairphone so special? Yeah, and I wasn't around eh, when the company, oh, I was around, but I wasn't so much involved. So um, I only joined Fairphone in 2017. Um, but what is so special is that indeed it wasn't, originally it was an awareness campaign. So Bas van Abel, the founder of Fairphone, was asked to develop a campaign to raise awareness around conflict minerals. Conflict minerals are uh, materials that actually are mined, often in, uh, in Africa, specifically in the DRC, in the Congo. And then um, the, now yeah, the revenues of this, this now yeah, conflict mineral, whether, now, whatever mineral it is, is used to fund the conflict that is going on. And people back then were not aware of uh, conflict minerals and actually not aware about the world behind their phones anyway. And then uh, Bas worked at the Waag Society uh, uh, here in Amsterdam. And the idea was to start a campaign to make people a bit more aware what's actually inside your phone. And now. He went to Congo, figured out, hey, what is actually going on here? Uh, nah, yeah, really uh, a cowboy story with uh, uh, nah, people going in mines and bribing ministers and nah, yeah, really eh, uh, a campaign and things you want to know about. But after a few years of campaigning, they realized, okay, we're making people aware eh, that things are going on. But it's also a bit frustrating when you know, oh, this is going on, this is the world behind my phone, but there's no alternative. And that is when Fairphone as a company was founded, and well, yeah, they said, okay, we're gonna become part of this industry to show from inside out that change is possible and see how we can apply the rules of the big boys also to a fair company. But I think we will touch upon <laughs> that later. <laughs> Absolutely. Exactly. So you just talked a little bit about how the company came about. So um, if I stand in the store and basically have the choice either an iPhone or a Fairphone, so what makes a Fairphone special? Compared to an iPhone? For example. Yeah, now yeah compared actually to every phone, um, what makes it special is on one hand, now yeah, what I already said, when you buy a Fairphone, you support a company that really tries to change this industry. So our mission is not world dominance. Our mission is that we want to establish a market for ethical electronics to motivate the industry to act more responsibly. So the idea is that we show, hey, there are consumers willing to pay for more ethical, meaning more fair and more sustainable electronics. And if we show that you actually can make those ethical choices in your supply chain, and on the other hand, also be commercially successful, mm. that's how we motivate the industry. So when you buy a Fairphone, you support that. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. one part. Um, another part is that uh, the, the people who made this phone, eh, a, a phone actually travels across all the continents in the world and goes through thousands and thousands of hands. And what we try to establish in that supply chain, create fairer working conditions for the people actually, or mining the minerals, mm -hmm. or assembling your, uh, your phone in the end. So it is about working conditions. And then the moment that it actually is in your hand, um, 
Uh, it, I'm sorry, it is about working conditions, but also obviously about the environment and mm. the supply chain. But the moment that it is in your hand, what is completely different is that Fairphone tries to convince you to keep it in use for as long as possible. So we're not convincing you to buy the next model and to immediately let it go and tell you like, yeah, you have the 12, but the 13 is so much better and you're actually a bit outdated. What we try to, to convince you is that the most sustainable thing you can do as a consumer is keep the phone that you already have in your pocket. And that is really, yeah, completely different from all other brands. Mm, that's for mm -hmm. sure. Mm, the New York Times called Fairphone the antithesis of most smartphones today. Do you think that's accurate? Sorry, what did you say? Uh, the New York Times yeah. called Fairphone the antithesis to most smartphones today. Do you think that's accurate? <sighs> yeah, it's always nice, right? <laughs> <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's embrace the compliment. Um, I wish it wasn't, but uh, yes, we still are. Mm -hmm. um, we really try to show that there is a radical change needed. Huh? Therefore, also, we constantly say change is in your hands and that change is needed in the industry. And unfortunately, we are still radically different from all the other devices, but I wish we would have had a few more followers, mm -hmm. at least on some aspects. Mm. Touching on that note, um, I think it's fair to say that sustainability um, has reached mainstream concern. However, you are the only smartphone manufacturer that puts a heavy emphasis on it. Why do you think that is? Yeah, I think actually your statement that sustainability is mainstream mm -hmm. in electronics, to be fair, go in every random shop around you and try to figure out where you see anything about sustainability. Mm -hmm. It's still super, super, super rare. Mm -hmm. And the electronics industry is really a laggard if you compare it to food or fashion or energy. Yeah, why is that? <laughs> that is a hard question. Um, somehow, I think it has to do with the fact that for a smartphone, you only need to dig in the ground. Mm -hmm. Everything you need for a smartphone in the end is digging in the ground, getting the materials and making it. While for many textiles or food, you need a plant or a tree, or, and that requires a slightly longer vision because mm -hmm. you need to take care of now yeah, that tree or that plant or whatever that you need. Um, plus, it is a really young industry. Yeah, so it, but it is super short-term focus, mm. rapid life cycles. You have innovation every quarter. Uh, and then I say innovation because smartphones over the past years actually became more and more alike. Mm. Yet it is sold to us like, wow, this is really radical innovation. So I would state that electronics actually is quite far behind still. Mm, okay. Mm. So would you say companies like Samsung, Google, Apple produce unfair phones? Yeah, uh, I always, we strongly believe in collaboration. So um, we are a bit of a mosquito in the room. And um, so we, I don't like to talk bad about the competition. I don't think that is for me the way to go to get them in that no, yeah, rhythm of, hey, let's embrace sustainability. So no, I wouldn't state that. Mm -hmm. I do think they can move a bit faster. Mm -hmm. um, you've briefly touched upon this, but we really want to take a closer look at supply chains. And uh, we really want to question why are traditional smartphone supply chains, are they by default unfair to the environment and the workers? Are there historical aspects? Why is this the standard in the industry in the first place? <laughs> to, to, <laughs> to ask a light question. Um, yeah, it is a bit... That is maybe strange to say, but child labor in the cocoa industry quite often looks really like an really sweet. Eh? You have a forest and you have a child with their parents and nou ja, eh? working and carrying two heavy stuff or working with two, uh, eh? two dangerous gear, but quite often it, it looks um, 
Now, not immediately that you're like, oh, this is completely wrong. Mining is really something completely different. There's no nice story. To, it's 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 a dirty industry. It's it's dirty work. It is. Yeah, it happens uh, many meters beneath the ground. Um, it's dangerous, per definition. Um, so in that sense, yeah, I think it is in the nature of the industry to a certain extent. Eh? Now let's also not, no, it's not dangerous per definition. Eh? You also have large scale mining, but what we specifically try to influence is artisanal mining. So really small groups of people that now, yeah, literally dig into the ground and try to find a vein to get now, yeah, the material they're looking for. And it does provide value, huh? so that is also the reason why people do it. Uh, so you can earn also uh, money with mining, but it is super dangerous and often indeed, uh, yeah, th there's child labor involved or exploitation, things like that. So yeah, is it in the nature of the industry? I don't want to believe that, huh? because that is also what we try to change. We think, okay, you can also mine in such a way that people can earn a living income and that uh, they are better protected and that children actually are not at the mine site but at school. So now I don't think it is in the nature of the industry, but right now it is really common for artisanal mining. So it's not the exception, it's more the rule. Mm -hmm. Okay, then let's talk a little bit more about the exception. Um, so let's take tin, for example. It's a very essential component to all smartphones. All smartphones have it. Yeah. Um, could you maybe take us through the steps involved of sourcing the mineral from the mine and how does it end up in the fair flow for you as a company yeah. specifically? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, if we talk about tin, uh, tin is mainly in the soldering paste. Eh? So you have, uh, when you open your device, there, there yeah, is a PCB and then all kind of little, yeah, very little pins of metals are glued to that board, and that is soldering paste. Um, that contains the tin that, uh, as we call it now, fair tin. And originally, tin is one of those conflict minerals. So originally, uh, when Fairphone was founded, uh, yeah, was founded, tin is one of those minerals where we set up, okay, um, a supply chain from the DRC because many uh, suppliers actually moved to Australia because uh, there was legislation that prohibited um, to use those minerals, yet that is not the solution for the people in Congo if mm -hmm. you then move to, to Australia. Mm -hmm. So Fairphone was involved in setting up uh, the first conflict-free tin supply chains. Um, so then you have a source and then actually the hard part, I now talk about soldering paste, but there are more elements that contain tin. And then you need to convince um, the refiners and the smelters to get to use that tin, to buy it, to pay a premium and to use it. And then also to convince the supplier afterwards to use that, that material. And for tin, um, yeah, the good part is that we actually um, now set up an, an entity eh, that actually more, for example, also Apple and Samsung and all other suppliers actually can use tin from that source. So that is good, eh, because that's also the theory of change of Fairphone. It's not that we try to keep things to ourselves. The idea is that we try to set up fair sources um, and, and, and now come up with certain solutions. But then we also invite other players to join in. Mm -hmm. That's okay, hey, please join in. This is now available, and the moment that you join in, then it has an impact on a way larger scale. Now, with TIN, for example, that happened. Mm -hmm. But now, we also try to go to the next level, eh? because now we have conflict-free TIN, but now we're also trying to figure out how can we get to fair TIN. Mm -hmm. And that also contains, for example, work in the communities around TIN mines. We're now in a, in a pilot with um, uh, unconditional cash transfers. So on a regular basis, we actually just send money to a selected group of people in the communities around the TIN mines to see if that actually sets in motion, besides that you have yeah, better working conditions and better organization around those tin mines, that you also try to, to bring 
more improvements in the communities around those mines, and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just have a quick specifying question. Yeah. How exactly did you set up that conflict-free tin? Uh, what kind of process did that involve? Uh, to be fair, I don't really know because I wasn't around back then, eh? so I don't know all the details. What we normally do is, eh? so for example, if I talk about uh, gold, and that is normally our approach, um, we work together with uh, yeah, organizations on the ground. Eh? So I don't have a team in Tanzania, or I don't have. Now I do work uh, quite intensively with certain organizations, but those are not Fairphone employees. So, for example, if I talk about gold in Kenya, then we work with the Impact Facility and Solidaridad. And yeah, it really is step by step. So first you try to find, yeah, it's always around artisanal mining, so then you try to find mines. The first step is to, to get a legal base. Yeah? So mm -hmm. quite often that is not a legal mine site. So first is that you try to get, a, yeah, that is legalized, that they actually are permitted to mine there. Then you try to set up an organization, quite often that's a cooperative that they collaborate with. But then you also start working uh, on trainings that they know about health and safety, how to yeah, make the mines uh, more, more stable, eh? and you provide the materials. And then step by step, by you, yeah, you provide um, uh, the gear, actually the helmets or other stuff that they actually need. But then that is step one or several steps is step one, but then you also start about, okay, if we pay a premium, where should that premium then be spent off and that on? And how do you then enable them to also lease certain equipment that will increase their productivity? And at the same time, you also collaborate on how do we get those children out of those mines and the child labor free zone. So it's really step by step by step, but then the, the the problems are different per material, eh? with gold, child labor, and specifically to, to, to mine gold, you need mercury, which is super polluting for the environment. So there you also focus a lot on different production methods and child labor, where uh, with tin, you don't need that uh, mercury, and it was more on yeah, the, um, the safer working conditions. So it is it also differs a bit per geography, per mineral, but yeah, this is normally how we work. So step for, by step by step, we try to yeah, move forward and, and make it step by step better. And therefore it's also important to say that we, we don't claim to be 100% fair. Eh? Mm. It's really a step by step approach, but you need to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. So speaking of that, um, we just talked about one resource compared to the 100 or even more uh, components within the smartphone. Do you think that there will ever be a 100% sustainable and ethical smartphone possible? Um, yeah, uh, I hope so. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's more hope. Eh? And hope for me is, is something that... Uh, it's not per se that I know, it's not optimism, it's not that I per se know, oh, this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And it's also not that I say, oh, it's all going to be all right. But I know that it is important and that's why I dedicate my time to this. So that is mm -hmm. more the reason than that I now can say, yeah, there will be a 100% fair phone, no worries. Mm -hmm. What I do know is that Fairphone by itself can't make a 100% fair phone. We need the industry to, mm -hmm. to get in action as well. Um, so you just outlined a very strong engagement with the local communities, with the suppliers. In comparison, how does it look for Apple or Google, for example? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how often Apple is in a mine site in Kenya mm -hmm. or in Tanzania or in Congo. I, I don't know. Mm. All right, fair enough. <laughs> um, so I think it's also fair to say that your sustainable and ethical supply chains, they were quite novel within the consumer electronics yeah. industry. Yeah, that um, is fair to say, so I can <laughs> copy that. You already learned that I don't want to say negative things about Apple and Samsung. Yeah. Um, so what challenges did you face when you first tried to establish them? Um, no, I did the first a bit, huh? so... Um, 
Let's now maybe, we already spoke a lot about conflict minerals, now maybe it is good to talk also a bit about the factories eh, in, uh, in Asia. Mm. Um, yeah, it's uncommon. The whole industry is geared towards those rapid life cycles and the lowest costs. And that's really uh, yeah, what drives the supply chain. Mm -hmm. And if you're then in there and say, hey, but actually, we want this device to remain in use for as long as possible. So we want longer warranty and we want you to, to produce spare parts. And we also would like to pay a living wage bonus to the factory workers hey, that bridges the gap between a minimum income and a living income. Then at first you hear, this is uncommon and this is, uh, hey, this is not something that, uh, that we can do. Mm -hmm. And to then discuss that and try to convince them and try to find ways, um, yeah, it requires a lot of persistence and stubbornness mm -hmm. and uh, convincing. Mm -hmm. But it is also fair to say that um, for every device, we did find suppliers who are willing to collaborate. And mm -hmm. there are like-minded people in all those companies and you need to try to find them and convince them yeah. and inspire them to, to also say, okay, yeah, I'm going to try to get this done in my organization. Mm -hmm. And in the end, things do get in motion, but specifically those rapid life cycles versus uh, longevity, yeah? so keeping a device in use as long as possible, yeah, that's really a clash. Mm -hmm. That really is hard to, to, to match. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned that some suppliers already shared your values and were happy. Some, some of them, not all. <laughs> <laughs> of course, yes. <laughs> no, um, yeah, actually, that, that is, that, so um, we actually, in the end, our main supplier is the assembly factory. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So in the end, all those different components come together in a factory that assembles that final device. And that is our main point of contact our main supplier, and that's also um, yeah, the company that we develop our phone with. Mm -hmm. But then that's, that's our first tier supplier, but then if you try to change an mm -hmm. industry, you also need to go further. And then first we focus on yeah, the big um, uh, components, mm -hmm. but also the other way around, if you're talking about gold, okay, that is in so many different uh, components, now let's first talk about the PCB, okay, and then the battery connectors, and, that. and so step by step by mm -hmm. step, so from two ways you're approaching different suppliers. Mm -hmm. And did your competitors react at all to your ethical and sustainable supply chains? Uh, not publicly, mm -hmm. but uh, behind the scenes we do have, we are in contact with them, and we do mm -hmm. share knowledge, and we have discussions. Mm -hmm. okay. And what I actually always like is that they also do refer in their sustainability reports. So they do refer to uh, research that Fairphone did. Or so, oh, yeah, okay. they know they are aware we exist. <laughs> <laughs> but publicly, they, they don't talk about Fairphone that often. Mm, okay. We're not big enough, maybe, or <laughs> too, too annoying. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you as a company, obviously... Um, tried a lot in order to bring sustainability and ethical concerns in your supply chains. Um, how do you evaluate political efforts to do that? For example, the recent EU Supply Chain Act. Um, no, yeah, actually, <laughs> we try. Fairphone is about system change. I already at start said our mission is about establishing that market. Mm -hmm. And our approach is that we have three steps. So, so the first step is raising awareness. That's also where Fairphone originally was founded. So we uncover that complex supply chain behind the, the products. We research a lot, and then we publicly share what we found and what's going wrong. Not only to our industry peers, but to nou ja, the broad audience. Mm -hmm. Then the second step is that we try to innovate in our company on scalable solutions. So, yeah, it is a bit uh, uh, a social setting, a commercial setting, mm. where we test uh, whether indeed a material can be integrated, whether we can set up uh, a living wage bonus program, whether we can uh, improve the recyclability of our device. So we innovate in our own setting. Mm -hmm. And then the third step is that we 
actively call upon other industry players, join in, huh? mm. please come along. And that because then the impact goes way faster than we stick to the small volumes of Fairphone. Mm -hmm. And for several minerals and solutions, we indeed got big industry followers. Eh? For example, Tesla joined the Fair Cobalt Alliance, and then they, now yeah, eh? suddenly the effect and the volumes become way bigger. But you need all actors of a system in order to get system change. Mm -hmm. And now, where I started at the beginning about the normal companies, we are not normal. It's normal to just take, 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 and maximize your shareholder value mm -hmm. and your profit. That's normal, and what we do is not normal. And you need the government to, to, to change that paradigm mm -hmm. and to indeed set a level play, playing field so that you say, okay, I don't think it's normal that people can't earn a living wage, so I turn it around. This is the norm, and if you don't meet it, you have a problem. And the European Union is quite advanced in that. Mm -hmm. The European Union also with their design directives are really pushing for both longevity and uh, yeah, a fairer supply chain. Mm -hmm. And that is quite important because uh, our role is to show that it's possible eh, to do, be commercially successful and make ethical choices. And then, now, yeah, the role of other industry players is to see that example and mm. join in. But if that doesn't go fast enough, it is, in my view, the role of the government to say, okay, but this is what we aim for. This is what we would like to see. Mm. And Europe is quite important there because it, it raises the bottom, this mm. legislation. Mm. Okay. Fair enough, um, but let's assume that the way Fairphone is approaching business becomes the new normal, that yeah. Fairphone will be a normal company at some point, um, which would be great for the environment and for the workers uh, in the countries you mentioned, but what would be the, what would still be unique about Fairphone? Yeah, I get that question quite often, people, and it is quite unique, and eh? not many companies actually say, here's my USP, please take it. Um, mm -hmm. Now, a few answers. So, what I already, uh, you asked, when will there be 100% fair phone? Mm -hmm. I still, I think we still have a long way to go. So, we only cheerlead and applaud the moment we have followers, because the problems and the challenges in this industry are so severe mm -hmm. that a few less would be really uh, appreciated, and then we will focus on the next topic. Mm -hmm. So that is one. I think it will really take a long time before on all areas where improvement is needed, um, the industry will follow us. Mm -hmm. So the moment that they follow on the conflict minerals, we say, okay, conflict free is not enough, let's go to fair. Or when they follow on these minerals, we have uh, a bunch of other minerals that we can improve. When they follow on repairability, we will actually move forward to um, now yeah, eh, circularity that goes way beyond. Mm -hmm. So altogether, there's more than enough challenge. Plus, I'm building a brand um, and a company um, that actually challenges the industry status quo. Mm -hmm. And that has more value than just a device and the materials in there. Mm -hmm. Knowing that there are so many challenges ahead, I really think that that in the end is the USP, that we are a company that sincerely was founded to actually make the world a slightly better place. Mm -hmm. And we can apply that to many different um, challenges that are still available. And sure, there are many challenges. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. Right, um, I think now is the time to open the floor for some audience questions. Uh, in case you do have a question, just raise your hand and someone will come someone to Someone with the microphone will come to you. Phone. Um, how about the person with a gray sweater? Um, maybe this is a little bit beyond your expertise, but I was wondering, because you worked at Tony Ciccoloni and are you working at Fairphone, are there other industries which could also benefit from such a model? At Tony's, we always said uh, cigarettes is the next industry. I think <laughs> there is a different uh, development going on there. Yeah, I think actually many industries. I also, when I worked at Tony's, I never thought that... Um, I would move 
to smartphones. And I think in many industries, it is important that there is this company that tries to, to sincerely show and innovate on examples to be fairer and more sustainable. Um, so I haven't picked a new industry yet, <laughs> but I think actually there probably will be many more. Yeah. All right. How about um, the guy with the... I leave it up to one. you to see where you need to go first. <laughs> Hi. Um, are we guilty of providing that unfair system to, sus to be sustainable, or at least to sustain? You mean you? you as we as consumers, because basically 100% of all phones are in that unfair system, uh, bar like a few hundred thousand fair phones. Are we guilty? Um, now, what I, I really think is that, so I just spoke about the government. Eh? So all the actors have a role to play. But I think that specifically the brand organizations, they are a bit the directors in an industry because they communicate to the market and they uh, they have a brand, so they talk with consumers and, and distributors, but they also yeah, put a product in the market, so they also direct the, um, the supply chain behind that product. So I think our companies, uh, brand organizations, brand companies, they are the most well-positioned actors to start. Um, so I wouldn't say you are guilty, um, to be fair, no. Um, and that is why I try to raise awareness the moment that there is also an alternative. Because if you are aware and there's no really proper alternative available, how can I blame you? Meanwhile, you should be aware that as a consumer you can vote with your wallet, whether that is about electronics or fashion or um, well, yeah, eh, whatever industry we can talk about. So to think when you try to buy some, eh, when, when you're going to buy something first, the main thing is, do I really need this? <laughs> that is the most sustainable behavior. And then the second one is like, okay, is there an alternative that actually uh, is more friendly to the planet and the people on the planet? But I don't, I don't want to go that far that you are guilty of this system. I would say then more that the brand organizations are guilty of this system. Okay, we have time for one more question. Maybe the black jacket in the back. Yeah. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask if you demand a transparency from your shareholders uh, about where their money comes from to invest in Fairphone, if they would have a like, bad interest perhaps to control that market. Yeah, that's a good question, and we did, so I have multiple shareholders eh, that are uh, more uh, mission-aligned funds, uh, some of the founders, uh, some uh, eh, bigger governmental funds, but I also had a few angel investors eh, from the start when nobody uh, believed in Fairphone, they actually did believe in Fairphone. And yes, that is important, eh? so you do need to, to, to assess, hey, where does your money come from and what is actually the goal with your money. But that, um, yeah, that is, so uh, your question was more like, what do they want to do with the control of Fairphone? But that is quite clear because when you want to be a shareholder in Fairphone, you do need to sign, yeah, you commit to the mission. So only mission aligned shareholders can invest in Fairphone. So in that sense, what they want to, to, to aim, what they're aiming for with that investment and them being a shareholder in Fairphone, that is actually quite clear. Um, but for example, um, it's not that uh, b for example, one of the funds that are is um, investing in us is Bin Wimic. Uh, put your money where your mouth is, community. And behind Bin Wimic are all kind of different, yeah, families or and it's a group of people who want to invest their money, and then they take care of okay, where is this money coming from and what is their intent with that money. So to a certain extent, yes, but we mainly, um, yeah. Uh, 
focus on it going forward, like, hey, what are we going to do with this money? And of course, it's not that we say, oh, I don't care where this money comes from, but it's not something that I really trace back uh, fully because, yeah, uh, uh, it goes in multiple layers. Is that a clear answer? Yeah. Yeah, good. Great. Thank you for the audience questions then. You want to sell three times as much phones this year as you did in 2021, and you have already released four generations of phones so far. How do you reconcile such aggressive growth plans while preaching sustainability? Yeah, that is a good question. I get that question quite often. Um, and the funny thing is that it is related to those rapid life cycles. Because um, between the Fairphone 2 and 3, there was five, five years in between. Eh? So the Fairphone uh, 2 was launched in 2015, and only in 2019 the Fairphone 3 was launched. And you could say, okay, but that is the best way, because then you don't bring a new phone to the market, and then you don't, how do you say that, seduce other people to actually buy a new phone. Meanwhile, the industry is going rapidly. Eh? So, um, for the f you call that end of life notification, so end of production. So, I have this 1200 components in this device, eh? or now 400 components, 1200 different um, components beneath it. And then a supplier says, okay, I'm not going to produce this component anymore. You can order one more time. And then, uh, yeah, then it's done. Because this, this industry is moving forward. And then I need to figure out, okay, how much do I actually need? Now, I think so much, and I also need some for, for spare parts and warranty, and I think this. And then you buy it, and then you need to keep it in, on stock for seven years, eh? because uh, four more years of selling this device, and then a few more years of warranty, and also the people who buy it in the last year, you try to, to convince them to keep it in use for five years. What in the end is the result is that there is a lot of materials on shelves. You need to forecast really well, which is quite hard. Um, plus, it is all my cash that I also could actually invest in uh, no, yeah, developing the phone and running my business. And if you take so much time between launching a phone, in the end, it is more wasteful. Because in the end, you will have a lot of materials on stock that in the end, you don't use or you didn't really forecast properly. So you need to somehow stay a bit in the rhythm of the, um, um, of the industry. And where other players, at least yearly, but often multiple times a year, launch a new device, we now said, okay, for us, the optimum is now, optimum is now two, two and a half years between a device. That allows us, uh, on one hand, eh, the materials is always tangible. Eh? People understand that you have a spare part on the shelf. But the main driver actually is also the software behind it. Eh? So you need to allow people, if you say, okay, from that average two years, eh, because it's now... Uh, 26 months on average that a device remains in use in Europe. 26 months, so a bit over two years. If you want to extend that to five years, you also need to extend the software support, where now, uh, two to three years, that is it. If you now want to expand that to seven years, uh, because it's two years in the market, and also the people who buy it at the end of sales needs to keep it in use for five years, you're already stretching that, that life cycle of the industry from two to three years towards seven years of software support and spare parts availability. And if you consider that, then suddenly two to two and a half years already is a huge stretch. And um, what we do to avoid that uh, people feel like, oh, yeah, I have, eh, what's important, I still have the three, so I don't use the two, or sorry, the, the four, I don't want to show people like I have the latest model, I try to live by the values that I preach. Um, but what is also important is that the moment that you launch a new device, you somehow reconfirm the users of the three that they made the right choice. And we did that uh, sometimes by just only selling um, eh, the, between the three and the three plus. 
um, the camera improvement actually was backward compatible. So the users of the three could just take out their camera. I realize now that I didn't explain modularity yet, <laughs> but <laughs> um, yeah, so actually you could only swap the camera and that actually allowed you to be again confirmed that you made the, choi the right choice for Fairphone. So it's not a contradiction in order to really expand the lifetime from that a bit more than two years towards five years, you need to have a certain rhythm in launching a phone, otherwise you're mainly creating waste. So what would you say then some of the trade-offs are of being sustainable? Uh, yeah, your profit margin is lower. Yeah? <laughs> that is, it, it just costs money. That's as simple as that. And you ask your consumers to buy a premium at the moment that they buy it. Eh? So roughly, if you go for the same tax specs, as we then say it, eh? you pay at, at the moment of purchase, you pay around 100, 150 euros of premium. Over the lifetime of a phone, actually, you're way better off. It's, it's it economically makes more sense to buy a highly repairable, uh, long warranty, uh, long supported uh, phone because, yeah, uh, other people buy in two and a half, three years' time a new device, and this device remains in use, and you have a warranty of five years, and you have software support for five years. So it makes sense economically. And does that premium go mostly to suppliers or some? Yeah, it's a mix. Uh, it, it actually, that premium is needed for several things. So it is on one hand needed for the R&D. Eh? So this is indeed a modular device, which means that it consists of seven modules, a bit like Lego bricks. You put them together and that is the, the phone. Um, that modularity allows you to repair it. So if you break your screen, you don't need to replace your whole phone, but actually you just buy a new uh, display module. You screw it off at home, which is really nice to do. I can recommend it. You open your device, uh, take out the screws, and then you replace your display yourself at home. And then the rest of the well, yeah, components and the materials remain in use. And that is similar to what I just said about the camera. Uh, now, nah, most innovation actually was happening in the camera. What we then did is develop a new camera module that allows you to keep the rest of your phone in use. You just change the camera module and you have a completely new, um, new device. Uh, so developing that and that innovation takes money. Uh, indeed, the integration and having a team available to actually explore and innovate in those directions cost money. But it is also fair to say that our economies of scale also needs a premium. I don't have the, the, the purchasing power and the volumes that Samsung and Apple have right now. So I, all, the prices that I can get as Fairphone are not as competitive as now yeah, other players are, uh, uh, yeah, actually can uh, negotiate. So that premium is needed for several things, for long-lasting support, for keeping those spare parts on stock, for the innovation, for the better working conditions, but also partially because, yeah, our economies of scale is just lower. Mm -hmm. So um, talking about trade-offs, um, so far your high sustainability standards, um, they present an obstacle to global expansion. Uh, however, you recently announced that uh, uh, Fairphone will sell phones in Taiwan, which is the first time outside of Europe. So we were wondering, why Taiwan? Yeah, <laughs> um, I have a team in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the Fairphone team, uh, our headquarters is based here in Amsterdam, but I have also 15 people in uh, Taipei. Mm -hmm. uh, what function? Yeah, mainly the engineers, okay. eh? so the, the, they collaborate closely with the ODM, so the assembly manufacturer. Um, yeah, they, they are the engineers behind my, uh, my phone, so mm. that is mainly both hard and software. Um, and it also was opportunity driven, so it, it made a few things actually came together. It made sense, if you try to change an industry, it made sense to launch in an Asian country. Mm -hmm. This is feels like also a bit of our home country, yeah, because a big chunk of our team is there. And 
I don't know if it is because Taiwan is an island, but circularity is really high on the agenda mm -hmm. in, in Taiwan. So, um, yeah, it was an opportunity and we thought, okay, let's, uh, let's go there and see, because we have a network there and mm -hmm. a team, it made sense mm -hmm. as first country outside Europe. All right. Um, so to put things a little bit into perspective, in 2021, you sold roughly 100,000 phones, while Apple sold 250 million. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, these are like very um, stark contrasts. So what concrete impact did Fairphone had on the consumer electronics industry so far? Yeah, I uh, and, and it's actually a quote that I already learned at Tony's, because also there at the beginning our volumes were really eeny weeny and you mm. Um, it's a quote from Anita Roddick. Uh, she was the founder of the, of the Body Shop. And it says, if you think you're too small to have an impact, try going to sleep with a mosquito in the room. Mm -hmm. And it's that. Fairphone is that mosquito. And I do think that the big players are less comfortable in the status quo with us being around. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that we constantly show, hey, it is possible. So you're making up excuses because if we can do it, you can do it as well. And hey, we invite you, here is the solution. It's open on our website. We call upon you to take your responsibility as well. Um, I think that is, that is the biggest impact that Fairphone will have. Meanwhile, what you see happening is also because we really sincerely believe in collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, it starts with making them uncomfortable, and then we invite them to join in. Um, and I think our biggest impact is that we show it is possible. That is actually the main, um, the main impact that we have. Plus, yeah, if you then go to Kenya and see um, oh yeah, a mine site where you're like, hmm, things are, are improving here, mm. or uh, if you visit a, a factory in, in, um, in China and you think like, mm, this, this looks better and I'm happy that actually all these people are trained and that they're able to raise their voice and that we can pay a living wage. You also need to, to cherish a bit the, also the, the smaller direct impact that we make. Mm. And uh, in the long run, it is that indirect impact of that mosquito that is going to really, yeah, that is the main role of Fairphone in changing this industry. So the year is 2030. What would the world look like if Fairphone succeeds in all their goals and ambitions? Yeah. <sighs> Uh, that's such a tough question. I always get it, uh, or get it, not, not to, to diminish your question, but I always find it so hard to answer because, yeah, if you go back to what happened a year ago, eh? um, a bit more than a year ago, then there weren't chips in this industry. Eh? We were in the midst of Corona. Um, electric vehicles were not delivered. The PlayStation 5 launch was postponed and postponed, but no one could actually get a chipset. Um, that was then seriously harming our business. Now you don't hear that many people about chipsets anymore. Eh? Now it is that uh, yeah, the, the world actually changed a lot. So. 2030, I find it hard to figure out what will then, eh, what will the world then look like and what will um, Fairphone have changed by then. For me, the main thing is that um, keeping your device in use longer, that is really super important. So that you don't, uh, had, I always say the most sustainable phone is the one you have right now in your pocket. That is, um, that's more sustainable than a fair phone. And um, we're now at 26 months, uh, roughly. If I see, if I compare the figures of fair phone with the, the figures in the market, eh, after two and a half years in the market, less than 40% uh, is still in use. With Fairphone, more than 80% is more is still in use. So the main driver I am focusing on is expanding that lifetime of a phone. Because I strongly believe that 
um, bringing in that, that longer term in this industry, that's both going to have a huge effect on the planet and on the people working in it. Because if you keep a device in use longer uh, and, and get a longer term vision, also that will translate in better working conditions. So that's the main thing that I want to change in this industry, that people hold on to their devices longer. And I think if we are really able to change that, including new business models, eh, because that then also comes with it, then I think uh, this industry will have a longer term view and therefore become inherently more sustainable. Mm. And we wish you good luck with that. Yeah, Eva, thanks. thank you so much for being us uh, here today. Uh, thank you also for the audience um, to join this conversation. You can find all our upcoming as well as past interviews on our social media. So that's YouTube, Instagram, and Spotify. Yeah. Make sure to join our next interview, women's rights activist Shadi Sadr, about the protests in Iran on the 13th of January at 1 o'clock. Hopefully, we will see you there. And with that, a round of applause for Eva Gowans. Yeah. Nice. Thanks.